You're listening to The Emulsion Podcast, a show that informs and inspires the restaurant industry to work, live, and create better. My name's Justin Kana, and I'm a chef and media producer with almost 10 years of experience in award-winning restaurants all over the world. I created this show as a way to give back, to inspire the next generation, and to help you progress your career. The Emulsion Podcast is sponsored by you folks, and Patreon is where that happens. If you're here as a return listener and you enjoyed the episode you just came from and happen to want to support more episodes, I'd really appreciate it. Go ahead and check out patreon.com slash justinkana. Thanks in advance if you can. I totally understand if you can't. Free ways you can support this show include leaving a like or comment on this video, filling up all five stars on iTunes, or simply sharing an episode with a friend. This is a solo episode. Yep, it's just you and me. I'll be dishing up a curated list of articles, happenings, and headlines that I've been paying attention to over the past few days, and then season them with my perspective and opinions on the latest industry stories. If you want to dive deeper into any of the stories I cover today, full show notes are available on justinconnacom slash podcast. And if you come across a story you'd like me to feature in a future episode, shoot it to me on Twitter and hashtag the emulsion so I can find you. Let's get ready to welcome your host for this episode, Justin Kana. Let's do it. What is up, folks? Justin Kana here. I'm very, very excited you're here for this episode 72 of the show. Weird excuse uh, for any audio issues. It's a hot one in Seattle today. And fun fact, only 30%-ish of something in uh, apartments in Seattle actually have AC. So I've got the window open and the fan going, but I'm like practically kissing this mic. Uh, so we should be okay. Today, we're talking through so many stories. I just, I ended up booking, bookmarking a lot of articles. Uh, so this is definitely going to be a longer episode. Fair warning. But there is going to be an update on the Gabriel Hamilton story. The Grace Space in Chicago has a new plan. We're going to talk about that. A new way of choosing where to eat. There's an entirely new publication coming out. The Anatomy of a Kitchen. 30 most influential restaurants and about four or five other stories. I know. I told you it was going to be a long one. So we are live on Instagram. This is also being shot vertically so that I can post it on YouTube with the articles kind of next to it, uh, and then it can also be repurposed for IGTV if and when that happens. So leave your questions in the comments, keep the conversation going uh, wherever you're listening, but for now, today's beverage, a little uh, apricot LaCroix. I don't really, I, I think, I feel like I've talked smack on this flavor before, but it's hot, and uh, I'm trying to lay off the soda. I don't really drink that much soda anyways, but Anna and I bought like probably 48 cans of LaCroix, so it is what it is. So first up, a story I thought I was actually going to rip to pieces when I started reading it and when I bookmarked it, but I actually ended up learning quite a lot. Kate Wilski, Kate Wilski, yeah, writes an incredibly vulnerable and transparent piece about being a guest that has an eating disorder and how she kind of navigates spending time at restaurants. So it only took the first paragraph for me to kind of get some empathy for the situation. Again, uh, the title of the article is something along the lines of like, stop asking me if I have room for dessert, which I thought was going to be really thought provoking uh, about service. But then it ends up being about uh, talking about her talking about leaving rehab and having her first experience in a restaurant. She says, quote, you've already memorized the menu and chosen what to order with your dietitian. You've got a slip of paper in your pocket with coping mechanisms. You can't use the bathroom or put your hands under the table. The atmosphere is tense. The energy is weird and disaster can strike at any moment, end quote. And before you get all up in the comments, she does give a little bit of a disclaimer. She says, quote, of course, it's not a server's responsibility to manage the psychological machinations of an eating disordered brain. But but as the term hospitality industry suggests, restaurants are meant to be welcoming places. And if managers better understood what their service staff might be doing that could trigger someone with an eating disorder, it might be a big step towards creating a space that feels inclusive to everyone. As America's relationship with food grows increasingly complex, this effort becomes doubly important. Important and could impact a far bigger group than just those with a diagnosis, end quote. So she's got a bunch of tips to help us hospitality professionals that I'm going to share because I think that's some of the big takeaways and I'm going to kind of inject my opinion afterwards. So here are some of her tips for, for us. Quote, don't ask to take our order before we finished looking at the menu. Don't make value judgments about menu items. Whenever possible, don't come over to the table when someone is chewing or putting food in their mouth. Don't make comments about how much or how little someone ate. Don't ask if I quote unquote saved room for dessert. Don't, please, please don't clear any plates before everyone is done eating. 
and that is going to end her tips. Uh, and this is not just kind of a listicle article. She definitely breaks down each one of these points as to why she uh, suggests those as a tip, but it's actually really insightful. So to some of you, maybe these are just common knowledge, right? Like me, I grew up in the Midwest, so quote unquote, saving room for dessert and kind of clearing plates as people finished was the normal. Uh, it was only until I started working in New York City did I realize that there was this etiquette that goes along with service that's designed to make people feel more comfortable and welcome in in the in the restaurant um, chan- uh, but chances are and I'm not speaking for everyone most of us that work with food on the daily have a pretty good relationship with food right we love eating and drinking we don't really need fancy service we're pretty pretty low maintenance uh, but and like basically any time that we're not working that we're getting served food is is paradise but similar to the story a few weeks ago I covered on filet mignon some of these people that are coming in are battling demons that you know nothing about right their l- relationship with food can literally be life or death um, it can be incredibly psychologically debilitating whether they have this long list of allergies or certain smells just kind of eke them out from memories of their childhood. This author definitely battled anorexia for a long time and the first step is to flex that empathy muscle and really develop it so that you can kind of make sure you're doing what we're supposed to be doing is, and that's making people happy, right? Do I think that some of her points could be addressed a little bit more on her part with some communication to the staff? Yeah, probably, but she does a really good job of framing her her points as solutions that service professionals can start implementing like today, like immediately. So I really, really enjoyed that part of the, um, of her article. So next up a company I've been following closely since my time back at the French laundry, actually Heston, the California based kitchen designing powerhouse just announced a 36 inch cooktop that, uh, it's, quite large. It's like the size of your normal stove at home, but it, it's it's smart. That's the, that's the interesting part about it. So if you haven't checked out their Q system yet, it's essentially a really, really modern looking induction burner. It's like a standard induction burner, but it, it, it's designed thoughtfully and you can pair it with a saute pan or a pot that has a Bluetooth symbol on it. And they talk to each other about temperature of the pot and the burner. And it's essentially there to help you cook step-by-step guided recipes through their smartphone app. Uh, it, to me, it's really, really crazy to experience. I They have an office here in Seattle, Heston Q does, and a friend of mine actually helps with their social media. So she let me try it out. It's incredibly consistent cooking on this thing. It is much more revolutionary to me than it is gimmicky because there's a lot of those... Um, products out there that claim to help you cook cook smarter, cook better, but uh, it's actually a legit cooktop. It's not just a tiny burner. Um, it's so much more than that. And this, this big one is like a stove size of that. So it's got touch control. You can pair your smart pans with it. It's all induction, super clean looking. And overall, after meeting with these guys at the company at their office here in Seattle and seeing the larger commercial projects that they're going to work on, to me, it's no surprise that this was going to happen, that they were going to take this tiny burner and move it into the commercial uh, well this is more for their like custom designed kitchens for people who are totally overhauling the kitchen in their house um will it make it into the commercial style professional kitchen that's a good question uh we're going to talk about a lot of stories in the show today that have to do with uh decreasing the amount of human touch that has to go on to food and actually using robots so it could go it could go in either way uh anything to me anything that can be used to help uh, people cook more, uh, and, and it it sucks to say like not go to restaurants as much, but (laughs) I mean, I'm sure we all have those people in our lives who could use a bit of a hand in the kitchen. Uh, so anything that's, that's a tool in helping that is, is smart and, and I'm all about it. But what I do see this actually coming in handy with professionals is, to help with training, right? Like how can, what, what if you as a chef could create recipes that you could put someone in a kitchen for like a week with this smart induction burner and a iPad full of recipes, and they could go through your entire repertoire of your restaurant of recipes, seeing how each process goes. And then when they come out the other side, you just saved like a month worth of training that you had to pay them for otherwise. Does that make sense? So just thoughts that I have question of the day for you what are your thoughts on these kind of automation tools do you think it takes the tactile nature out of cooking if you've seen the heston q in action you'll know a little bit more about this um in a sense you're kind of preparing the food in the exact same way but the tool is just turning the knobs and adjusting the heat for you but i always love hearing the answers from both sides i certainly have chef friends who think that this is bullshit there's no soul in it once you uh introduce technology into it 
And some chefs are just crazy impressed because so many food businesses are about consistency, right? And then this system allows for the way that things are cooked to come out exactly the same every single time. Uh, nothing is ever burnt or undercooked. It's always the same, which can be incredibly valuable in a food business because consistency is key with so many of these businesses. Um and then on the consumer end, I've had people tell me that because this system takes the guesswork out of those turning knobs and adjusting the heat, they've actually learned a little bit more about that quote-unquote soul behind the cooking because they aren't as intimidated by new recipes. Uh, and then they learn, oh, this was what a sear is, and this is how you make crepes. You have to make, you have to have like a medium-low heat, and it's important to let the oil heat up after you add it to the pan, and all these things that are natural to you and me who have cooked in kitchens before, but it's hard to convey in a written recipe in like a food blog, right? So some people just learn best by doing, um, I'm just curious to hear, are you a fan or, or not really? Mm. I'm going to link up a really fun piece, uh, that Vox did as well in the show notes about robotic restaurants. They basically weigh the pros and cons of having a robotic, uh, in work enforced restaurant. It's a super entertaining video where this robot actually makes burgers with beef that it grinds to order. So you just load up these plastic tubes with peeled onions and whole tomatoes, and it does the whole kit and caboodle for you. Humans basically help reload the machine, and it makes kind of for smaller, more effective restaurants that can actually lower the cost for everyone and even result in the staff that is there that is human being higher paid because you know, you're making uh, higher margins so then you can kind of spread the love with the people that you're actually employing. So for me, it's ultimately the reason why I'm diversifying myself. I'm attempting to stray away from being a commodity. It doesn't matter how you feel about it because given the option of hiring someone at minimum wage for a year or paying $20,000 for one of these pieces of tech that's more consistent and doesn't require healthcare and doesn't show up late to work, for me, it's hard to think that the investor of this restaurant or food service place is going to pick the human once the tech gets good enough. Does that make sense? And that's, I know that's kind of hard to hear. I'm not really trying to fear monger anyone. It's just how the world works, right? Like, did you know that there actually used to be a job called a pin setter where you could, li your job was literally to set up the bowling pins at the end of a bowling alley. And then someone just came along and came up with a machine to do it, and we all moved on, right? Like, I'm not personally in the camp that's going to think that it, this is going to destroy jobs. Is it going to take away the job that you do on the day-to-day? -day? Yes, but there's also this list of, uh, like, we've seen it online, right? The jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago list, and it's fascinating, right? Like, if you can't cook the burgers, someone has to develop the recipes for the robots. And if that's a job that would get you excited and out of bed in the morning, maybe that is something to think about as this tech starts to, to develop and get, and get smarter and smarter. So it's about to become a real thing. I'm just trying to make sure that everybody's keeping their eyes on it because I certainly am. Next up, as as long as Ryan Sutton keeps doing restaurant reviews, you can bet your ass I'm going to keep covering them on the show because... <sighs> they frustrate me to no end. So this week he covered the bar at 11 Madison Park. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ryan Sutton writes for Eater. He's the quote-unquote chief critic at Eater. And he's in this stint of trying to um, trying out the restaurant's bar menus. And he titles this one, quote, 11 Madison Park's bar menu is a stellar gateway drug to artistic fine dining, end quote. And I really want to talk about this review I really wanted to like dive deep into it. I really wanted to talk about the dishes and the food and his opinion. But this, for me, just entirely turned into a rant about this guy as a reviewer. And so this is me writing it after I wrote the entire script. Uh, so this is what I wrote. Uh, right off the bat, I get pissed off at this guy. He goes, quote, about once a year, I swing by Daniel Hume and Will Godara's 11 Madison Park, a restaurant that's been in the news because it dropped a few places on a listicle for the bar tasting, end quote. And then he continues to say, I'm sure I'll get around to trying the proper menu at some point, but given its steep barrier to entry, I'll focus on the restaurant's more acceptable, accessible option, end quote. And it is so freaking hard for me to take this guy seriously. I'm sorry. I know I might be overly critical, but the dude runs two independent food blogs. Quote, he quote unquote runs them. One is called The Bad Deal, and the other one is called The Price Hike, and it's all focused on restaurant prices, which, unless I'm navigating their homepage incorrectly, both of these blogs, they haven't been updated in close to three years. So he's not really writing in that way anymore. He's just found a way to write these kinds of pieces for Eater. 
And all the stingy, cheap nature comes off in every single one of his reviews. And the worst part is Eater, one of the more trusted sources in food media, has him as their chief critic. And it's not productive for restaurants as businesses when an influential writer comes in and is literally only willing to take your alternative option, right? It's like if a writer for Spin Magazine or Rolling Stone came to a concert and didn't buy a ticket to the show but instead went to the merch stall and bought a t-shirt and a CD and then proceeded to write an article about how much they quote unquote love your work at the accessible price tag of $29 instead of the full price concert ticket. It's really, really ridiculous. Will it get Ryan more clicks on the site? Unfortunately, probably because that's the era that we live in. But would he, wouldn't he rather go back to his mission of educating people on why prices are the way that they are? That was like, that was like why he created the blogs that he created. And wouldn't he rather talk about why it's smart for restaurants to operate as profitable businesses? I don't know. I, I get that the consumer is single-minded and all they want to hear is, what's the value for money? I'm paying $150 for dinner. What am I getting? You know what I mean? That's all some people want to hear. But it just seemed like he had such a good thing going and he took the cozy job of writing for Eater as kind of a cop-out. So here's a couple of quotes from him for the article. He says, quote, so I waited an hour for dinner, alas, but then I ate very well, end quote. Dude, you went to a walk-in, no reservations bar at a three Michelin starred restaurant in Midtown Manhattan. I go to Walrus and Carpenter here in Seattle and I wait like 90 minutes for a table and you only had to wait an hour for 11 Madison Park's bar tasting menu. Who do you think you are? Right? Like, you know what's fun about making a reservation at a restaurant? You don't have to wait. The problem with great restaurants is that they book up quick. Like, you got to pick a side. Do you know what I mean? And then he says, quote, Just one gripe. The restaurant's heralded caviar cheesecake isn't served in the bar. The kitchen instead sent out the lousy Benedict as a substitute, a caviar tin holding, in a circle of asparagus gelée, hollandaise, and sturgeon roe. End quote. He didn't even go eat in the restaurant, and he's mad that the dishes served in the restaurant aren't served in the bar. I don't understand what this guy is trying to say, right? Like, it's like in in the previous analogy about going to a concert, I was like, yeah, I went to the Logic concert. I didn't buy tickets to the show. I just stood outside the venue and I bought a t-shirt. I just have one gripe though. Logic wasn't outside in the venue to sing for me. It's just so stupid. I don't understand it. Anyways, in conclusion... He does recommend the experience, saying, quote, For fine dining aficionados who can try out some of Daniel Hume's new dishes without committing to the scary deposits or multi-hour dances of the formal room, end quote. I really wanted to end with a super savage mic drop on this story, but overall, this should be a exercise in knowing your ideal customer. I think so many of us are keen on saying that our food is for everyone. Everybody that eats will enjoy our food. But the truth is, Ryan Sutton clearly is not the right kind of person for the full 11 Madison Park experience. He lays it right there out for you, right? He says, deposits are scary for him. That's a pain point. And then he also says, the dining room experience takes too long. So as a restaurateur or a chef, you can take that information and do something, like create your own bar program or a takeout window or a smaller, more casual restaurant right next door to make sure that you widen your net to reach more people with your food, if that's the ultimate goal. Should 11 Madison Park listen and put that caviar cheesecake on the bar menu to attempt to maybe please some food writer who takes his photos for his articles on his iPhone? No. No, they should not. I could probably rant for an hour about this and this gentleman's writing. I'm clearly very passionate about it. I will save it for the next article because he's ultimately going to continue writing. I'm just going to give this guy... I I know I'm I'm literally just giving this guy more attention by covering his work on the show. Um, But I grew up in in the age of A Life Worth Eating and Ulterior Epicure and Sam Sifton writing for the New York Times and all of these super, super talented writers and critics and photographers talking about food. And I want you to be aware of what a subpar product looks like. Um, There's a quote that I'd like to share with you that says it better than I ever could. It says, quote, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong the man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. 
But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms and great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those so cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat, end quote. And I think I've said that before about critics, just as a, as a side note. Uh, next up, a really interesting article for anyone wanting to open their own restaurant someday or who works in a particularly rowdy spot. Vox published a piece called Why Restaurants Became So Loud and How to Fight Back. So it uses the Line Hotel in Washington, D.C. as a case study using an app called Soundprint. Uh, and as a reader... Uh, for the decibel level of a restaurant, 81 decibels was the average in this restaurant, with the max decibels peaking at 128 decibels, which is actually loud AF. And we all know the feeling, right? You go into a bar or you're having dinner on a Saturday night at 8.30 p.m., and we all have to be like, what? Or like, can you say that again? To the person that's literally like right across from you. And this article explores why, from the architecture of the space and the acoustic design to the materials that are actually used in the construction, uh, and then also like the music level, how loud is the music that they're playing, and even talking about the uh, American loudness, like how loud Americans are when they talk and why that is the way that it is. So if you're into that kind of stuff, it's a really, really interesting article if you want to learn a little bit more about those details and also how that weighs into the guest experience. But the, the article also talks about the fact that, quote, indeed, quiet restaurants can be as unwelcoming as noisy ones, end quote. So ultimately, my takeaway was there's kind of like a happy medium, right? As with most things in life, you have to balance between being the uptight mom at the party telling everyone to quiet down and then also being the loud and boisterous server that's encouraging everyone to kind of be rowdy AF. So I remember personally at Lisvaka in Norway for the first year and a half or so that I was there, we would have DJs come in on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we would turn into a nightclub at 10 p.m. And the DJs would come in to play their set, and that would encourage people to come hang out at our very high-end modern bar, and we would get complaints all the time that people would be halfway through their nine-course tasting menu, and, like, techno would start playing really loud, and so, like, how do you deal with that? Um, personal preference, I think, is really, really hard to deal with because everybody likes it a little bit of a different way. But it is absolutely a thing that people go into certain places distinctly because of their noise level. I think about there's a coffee shop here in Seattle that I go to specifically because it's super quiet and really open and lots of natural light. There's a lot of people that go there either by themselves to get work done or they have like meetings with just two people. So it's like and the, the space is set up in that way. There's not like a big table for people to congregate around. Um, would I leave? Would I stop going there if they started playing loud music? Probably. So I think about that a little bit when I'm trying to like weigh both options. Uh, but this author does give a few tips for your for guests at your restaurant saying, well, for for if you are going to be a guest at this restaurant, and this is something you might hear from guests uh, at wherever you're working to avoid the noise complaints, says she says, quote, go early, request a quiet table, ask for the music to be turned down, complain or return to restaurants that you enjoy over and over again to make sure that you're giving them some love. I was going to be super critical of these, but it's it's overall true, right? Like, if you aren't a fan of something that's completely within reason, you should speak up. And as an owner, if you keep receiving critical feedback over and over and over again, you're better off serving your customers by making some changes and definitely look into those options. But at the same time, there's two quotes I'd like to share. One being something along the lines of, like, the easiest way to fail is to try to please everyone. So just keep that in mind. And the other one being, if you go out on the street and encounter an asshole, that person is an asshole. But if you go out in the street and everyone is an asshole, you're an asshole. So just keep that in mind, too, as you're getting this feedback. The next story, a suggestion from a podcast guest, actually, Derek Simsek, wanted me to talk about a uh, update on a story that we've been cataloging for a few weeks now on the show. So Gabriel Hamilton is supposedly in the deal to take over the Spotted Pig restaurant in New York City because of her ego. That was the interesting development that happened since we talked about it last. So the... The article saying, quote, Gabrielle was jealous of April Bloomfield, who is also openly lesbian and even more famous as a chef than Gabrielle, end quote. And that was an insider talking to the New York Post. So this will not only give uh, Gabrielle and her partner, I forget what her name is, 
access to Ken Friedman, who is still involved in the entire project. And he has access to people like Jay-Z and, and all these other celebrity investors. And he also has a huge network of his own. But they're also going to triple, essentially, their restaurant size because Prune the restaurant that Gabriel has before is just 30 seats and Spotted Pig is actually 100 seats. So to me, is this overall surprising? Yes, I didn't see jealousy of status and fame as a reason to take over a restaurant. What I did say, I think, when I covered this the first time is I can only imagine what the feeling was having the Spotted Pig on the table being offered to you. But now I see that that was kind of like how it played out the whole time. It's honestly... To me, I see it as being a little petty and selfish, um, but I have empathy to those feelings, right? I know how it feels to be the next in line for something and then get denied, and I also know how it feels to kind of like hurdle over someone because you've just been working your face off, and it feels good, right? So it's it, is it going to pay off in the finish line for her career? Maybe. We'll see. But ultimately, I know I know this is easier said than done. Play the long game. Those things that are hard won are ultimately the sweetest once you get them. And I'm just going to keep updating you, I guess, and see. we're going to see where this all goes. It's, it's going to be interesting. So next up, the Rob Report in celebration of their 30th anniversary with their, quote, Best of the Best Awards, which covers places and products and people. They put out their list of the 30 most influential restaurants of the last 30 years, and they didn't do their, this list on their own. They enlisted Maddie Matheson, Dominique Ansel, Mario Carbone, Corey Lee, Alone Shia, Massimo Bottura, and even more to make this a very, very curated list that you can probably expect who's on it, but I'll go through it anyways because it's only 30 restaurants. So El Bui, Charlie Trotters, Echibari, Alinea, Chez Panisse, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, Fat Duck, French Laundry, Gramercy Tavern, Harvey's, Husk, Larpege, La Bernadette, Le Chateaubriand, you can tell this is alphabetical, Michelle Bra, Momofuku Noodle Bar, Nobu, Noma, Prune, Puyol, Spago, WD-50, and then there's a couple more casual spots on the list like Au Pied de Cochon, uh, Cochon, Dookie Chase, Prince's, St. John's, Highlands Bar and Grill, and Squirrel. And I hope I'm not missing any. I felt like I typed those all out individually, so hopefully I didn't forget any. Somebody can count up and see if that's 30. But it's so funny to me, right? I'm going to reference this the last article uh, that I just covered about uh, Gabriel Hamilton briefly because if Prune sounds familiar, it is Gabriel Hamilton's restaurant. So that's the lady that we just covered who has ego issues about her restaurant not being as quote-unquote famous as April Bloomfield spot. And if you noticed, there's no April Bloomfield restaurant on the 30 most influential restaurants over the last 30 years of the world. So the article saying, quote, Gabriel Hamilton's little 19-year-old restaurant is small and almost unassuming, but it brims with confidence. There has to be a level of self-assuredness to present simple dishes well done without a ton of ego-boosting culinary pyrotechnics on the plate. And as the New York dining scene the last two decades has been littered with the bones of failed restaurants, she's shown that this personal and sometimes eclectic style of food can endure. Funny, huh? Isn't that funny? It just goes to show that gratitude is real, recognizing what you've accomplished is real, and bec not becoming complacent or stagnant, uh, but being hungry about the right things is important. And referring to my ego is the enemy video a little bit, it's more important to be involved with an influential restaurant rather than be a famous chef just for fame's sake. And I mean, unfortunately, the way that the story is playing out right now, that's what she's getting caught up in. So I mean... Back to the list. Is it a good headline to publish for clicks? Yes. 30 influential restaurants. We all see it and we're all going to click on it. Um, was it smart to outsource the uh, opinions to people in the industry? Yes. Absolutely yes. Was th There was only a few items, there was only a few places on this list that I would have personally swapped out. But then it can be argued the other way that the places that I swapped out were influential. I don't think there is a uh, list that says that you are like this probably could have been a 50 or 100 restaurant list and some of us would have still probably agreed. So it is what it is. We don't have control of the list. If you want a list, um, you can publish it online right now. Um, I do have this poster. I'll show you folks one day when I want to launch an online shop. It's kind of like one of those lineage posters. You can see like Paul Bocuse is in a bubble and then he's connected to Thomas Keller and then he's connected to Grant Ackett's and Grant Ackett's also has a line connected to Ferran. Uh, it's a really cool poster and I have it in a closet here in my apartment. I'll link it up in the description if I, um, 
find the link for it. Um, but that's another question for you folks. What restaurants have influenced you the most and who is missing from this list of these people that I listed off? Um, it's just another curious question uh, that I actually have for you is where do you draw the line between inspiration and influence and straight up stealing and copying, right? Like it's something that I've struggled with a lot. My food basically looks like a Frankenstein of the restaurants that I've worked at, but that's kind of the point, right? Like if you go to these places to learn, then you ultimately have to forge your own path to be influential yourself. Uh, but I also look at like Grant at Alinea. He like he as a huge source of inspiration for me, and he was essentially a fusion of French Laundry and El Bouilly, the two places where he trained before going to Trio. And he's very forward about that and admitting it. But and people love it, right? But regardless, it's definitely tricky not to get in my own head about being like quote unquote original and then adopting more of that like steal like an artist mentality. But that's just my thoughts. So a story that you know that I've been wanting to update for a while and now there's finally news on it. Grace, the Chicago three Michelin starred restaurant that closed in December due to owner issues. They have a plan now. So Mari Katsumura, the pastry chef and old co-worker of mine, is going to be taking it over. So small caveat for those that, that that don't know, I was actually on the opening team of Grace. I left after some pretty shady stuff happened. I've got an update. Uh, I've got an episode that kind of the first story of that episode is all about that. Um, so there's definitely a personal connection to that restaurant for me. But this news is more of a headline than actual news. So Mike Olzowski who was the original investor in Grace, will be backing the project, uh, Mari's project. It doesn't have a name yet, um, but he's going to be involved, much like he said he would after Curtis Duffy and Michael Muser left Grace. But it is unclear what his official role will be. I know that he was a pretty big proponent in securing that real estate um, in the West Loop and assisting with the general contracting for the space, making sure that all the details were how they wanted it. So it's going to be interesting to see how he's involved after the space is already there, right? Because he can't really help with that part unless they're going to do some sort of facelift afterwards. So they're scheduled to open in fall. It will be quote unquote Japanese French fine dining, end quote. And with her experience at places like Blackbird and Acadia, plus with her parents' lineage in restaurants, it seems like the only people that are skeptical about the success of this project is the people who say that the fact is that she's attempting to kind of like grow a new concept into a restaurant that was designed for Curtis's vision. That seems to be the only uh, rebuttal that people are saying. So this is one of the first times I can remember covering a story like this where it's essentially the skeleton of a restaurant that's being inhabited by a new vision um, that's more on the fine dining side. Uh, in casual restaurants, I guess it happens all the time, but most times... Um, the last time I guess I can remember it happening was with Laurent Gras leaving L2O and someone else coming in. Um and that worked pretty well, so we're going to have to see what happens. I know the Chicago food scene is one of the most open-minded cities in the U.S. Uh, they're always excited for new and ambitious things. It's going to come down to the creative and the execution. I'll definitely, definitely be paying attention to it going forward. I would actually love to have Mari on the podcast so her and I can catch up and I can ask her all of your questions that you might have. So next up, a story that I thought I was really going <laughs> to enjoy covering, but it ultimately fell short for me. The Town Dish, which is a publication I've never covered before, published an article called The Anatomy of a Kitchen, The Anatomy of a Restaurant Kitchen Talking About, uh, surprisingly, a restaurant in a mall, which is called Mistral K.O.P., in Pennsylvania. It's essentially the Kitchen 101 article that you hand your aunt when she wants to, quote unquote, learn more about what it is that you do. So it's essentially like, this is Garmage Station, plus two sentences about what that station does, and then Roast Station, and, and, and all of this useless information. It's nothing exciting for us. It's not useless, but you know what I mean. So uh, it's great exposure for the restaurant, no doubt. I'm a firm believer that there's always someone who is interested to see how the sausage is made. Um, but overall, is it valuable for you and me? Maybe not. So, but if you are starting and you really want to like, you want to get a, a taste of what a more modern kitchen brigade looks like, maybe check it out. I don't know. Next up, the U the New York Times ventured to San Francisco to research a piece called, quote, San Francisco restaurants can't afford waiters, so they're putting diners to work, end quote. 
And if this sounds familiar, it's because we covered a story earlier this year talking about a concept called fast fine dining. And that's very similar to what this article talks about. It uses a restaurant called Suvla as an example. And I'm pretty sure that was also involved in the articles that we would talk about uh, back in the day when we were initially talking about fast fine dining. So, quote, the small menu is so appealing and the place itself so charming that you almost forget, as a diner, that you have to do much of the work and dining out yourself. You scout your own table, you fetch and fill your own water glass, and if you'd like another glass of wine, you go back to the counter, end quote. So the article definitely references that uh, fast, fine vernacular, but it's also called a hybrid restaurant, uh, referencing higher minimum wage and a higher cost of living as reasons why businesses have to work smarter and why all these changes are coming in to the, the, the flow of being a guest at one of these restaurants. So my favorite quote, not surprisingly, comes from Charles Belilis, who opened the first Suvla in 2014. He says, quote, We can sit around here or, and we can complain and whine and moan. We can be very negative about this, or we can sort of turn it on its head and see an opportunity, end quote. Should be no surprise why that was my favorite quote. But there's also some really interesting stats, too. So Quote, at the original Suvla, the counter is just inside the front door, so a line invariably spills out onto the sidewalk, a neat marketing trick that also means the restaurant wastes little of its rented space on waiting customers. Suvla has just 40 seats, but averages more than 900 meals a day, and the small menu is more conducive to takeout, which produces more than half of the revenue at this location. So probably the more interesting part of the article was when they went across the street to talk to uh, Tracy Desjardins at Genardier. I hope I'm saying that. I'm not saying that right. French is not part of my day today. She talks about the fact that her labor costs are at 43% right now. That is up from 27% in 1997. So after 20 years, uh, almost 20 years, she's up uh, 16% on her labor costs. That is crazy. But she says she's experimented with raising prices. and then she. But then she says, quote, customers simply spent the same amount in different ways, skipping that second glass of wine or ordering two appetizers instead of an entree, end quote. So the article flips it, saying Suvla, on the other hand, is planning to expand beyond the Bay Area, starting with New York. But Mr. Belilis says he wanted to occupy, quote, iconic streets in iconic neighborhoods in iconic cities, end quote. And I know I'm on a kick, but this perfectly identifies another Ryan Holiday book uh, that I'm a big fan of called The Obstacle is the Way. It's basically encouraging you to go head on with what looks like a problem, and you'll come out the other side light years ahead of everybody else. And when Tracy was probably asking herself, man, labor costs are so high, how can we make more money to basically feed this obstacle? The guys at Suvla charged right into it and asked, how can we do this more effectively, Effective, uh, basically eliminating the obstacle entirely? So now, with that as the business model, they're essentially killing the game in a way that much, uh, so many other people can't even touch. And I can definitely see this as a weird hybrid of that robot story that we covered earlier. Uh, that, that robot mentality partnered with counter style service is a really interesting kind of future for restaurants in larger cities in the U.S. for sure. I'm, it's already happening, right? Like we can already see it happening. The question will become, when do food critics start writing about them and praising them for being great restaurants instead of just consumers going because the price is right and the food is delicious? I think that's going to be the ultimate tell as to whether or not these uh, get more widely adopted and more highly regarded and Once the food critics start talking about them and there's some sort of quote unquote fame to go along with, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the mastermind chef behind this automated restaurant. That's when I really feel like the, the people will aspire to be that. Um, that's just my opinion. So next up, a story I didn't see covered much of at all, but I still wanted to touch on. There's a new guide in town. It is called Truth, Love, and Clean Cutlery. So I'm going to read their mission statement for you folks. Quote, Truth, Love, and Clean Cutlery is a new, kinder dining guide designed to identify the restaurants and food experiences that go above and beyond great food and wine in the ethical and sustainable ways in which they run their business. Every place we list serves delicious food. That's a given. After that, our guiding principle has been the care taken by the people who run the restaurant. Care in sourcing the food and how it is produced. Care in dealing with its staff, customers, and community. 
care for the environment, and in terms of energy, waste, and water. We are deeply respectful of how hard it is to run a profitable and sustainable business in the highly competitive world of hospitality, and we are in awe of everyone who uses their businesses as a force of good. That's why we want the world to know about them, end quote. And I definitely let, left out a lot of that mission statement. It's like an entire page of ideals. If you want to check it out, uh, truthloveandcleancutlery.com, I'm pretty sure is their website. Um, but what stu- there's a few things that stuck out to me with this. One, Alice Waters is an editor. That might give you some insight as to the flavor of this project. Uh, it's very kinfolk e, if that makes sense. It's available November 1st. It's going to be a, I, I, Amazon gave me the option of a paperback, but it looks like a hard copy. Um, but based on the sample page that they have on the pre-order page on Amazon, they're going to break it down as a snapshot of the restaurant. So what is the restaurant about? Who's the chef? When are they open? The address, the number, uh, the number of the, the phone number and the website, the price on a scale of one to five, uh, what critics say about the restaurant, the signature dishes, as well as the, a little blurb from the editors and the contributors to the guide. So they inject their own opinion on their experience there. So overall, I'm really, really interested to see what happens with this publication because on one hand if you're a restaurant on the outskirts of Dublin and you're all about being sustainable and paying your people that doesn't get you very far as lists like the white guide or Michelin or world's 50 best go right like it's really hard to get recognized for that but as I said weeks ago once it becomes quote-unquote cool to be an ethical chef I think more people will follow suit and aspire to do that Do I think that Truth, Love, and Clean Cutlery will replace the Michelin Guide? No. Do I think that it's going to mean something to say that you're mentioned in the Truth, Love, and Clean Cutlery Guide? That's hard to say because it depends on how strict the team of editors is. It's a brand, right? So if you're super discerning and only put restaurants in the guide that go above and beyond, then it becomes a true expression of the elite. And that becomes bragging rights for the restaurants and that will kind of feed the beast, right? If it, it could go the other way and if they want to be all inclusive and make sure that the smallest act of sustainability gets rewarded, it's going to get watered down and none of us are going to care, right? So another interesting piece is the utility of it, right? How How is it going to actually be used as a guide? Are they going to produce content to tell the stories of these restaurants uh, through video um, or photos? Are they going to have a blog? Will they write the articles online? Are they going to have a downloadable app with a map in it? So if you go to London, you can see like this is a list of a bunch of sustainable restaurants in this city. How are they going to do it? Are they going to partner with Airbnb and their reservation system with Resi so that you book your Airbnb and, oh, here's a really sustainable restaurant right down the road? There's so many options, but those decisions are critical as to whether or not this takes off and becomes the new thing to strive for or if it's just another warm and fuzzy list about being heartfelt. That's an interesting... I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes. Um, I sent the guys at Blackwell and Ruth, the publisher for this book, an email to see if I could get a copy to review. And uh, I mean, we'll wait. We'll see what they say. If you want me to go ahead and review it, they have a contact page on their website. I send them an email. Be like, hey, I want Justin to review your book and we'll see what happens. So next up in quickie holy shit chef news, it's not just the NBA that's getting big players to come to California. In super random news, Joshua Skeens, founder of Cezanne, the three-star Michelin restaurant in San Francisco, posted a photo of him and Laurent Gras with the caption, quote, I am very excited to share that my good friend Laurent Gras will be joining the team at Cezanne. We have always seen eye to eye on so many of our values and timing aligned perfectly for both of us, end quote which is just crazy, right? My jaw definitely dropped when I saw this. And for those of you that don't know, Laurent Gras was one of the few OG heavy hitters for me when I was coming up in the industry like eight years ago. He had L2O in Chicago. His technique and presentation was like insane. Like for people outside of Paris cooking like stellar tasting menus, he was the guy. He could cook and butcher fish and create tasting menus like nobody's business. And then all of a sudden, he just left L2O and moved to New York City and did a bunch of private and exclusive cooking. And everyone thought for sure he was going to like take over New York City. And then over the past three or four years, I would say, I haven't heard many groundbreaking news bits from him like at all. And now out of the blue, two of the most influential chefs in the U.S. are now going to be cooking under one roof together. Hmm, right? Now my skeptical hat is on a little bit. Um, 
it it sounds super great in theory, right? Like Grant, Laurent Gras cooking at Cezanne, it's so perfect. But so much like other stories that I cover on this show, as they break, unexpected updates come as time passes. So I'm predicting, and this is me just putting it on the record so you guys know, that this is very it's very possible that Josh Skeens could be leaving Cezanne and Laurent Gras will take it over. So Josh built Cezanne uh, to be this incredible brand. So fire, Japanese technique, insanely good product, stellar service, um, but it's in the heart of San Francisco. And for those of you that haven't listened to any of Josh Skeens' content, he is very forward in saying that he's a backwoods kind of guy. He loves hunting and fishing and preserving, and he has his own ranch where he does these dinners that you need an invite to get into, and he's achieved a level of professional success that basically sets him up now to do these projects that he's crazy passionate about, and it would not surprise me if Laurent came and filled those shoes to keep Cezanne running um, while it's at the top of its game. And as of now, on Cezanne's site, Laurent isn't included on the team page, uh, but as far as what his role will be, I know that like both Per Se and French Laundry, Chef de Cuisines, have to go through a year of transition before they take on the job, so I'd be, I'm hard-pressed, like, this might just be the first step to that happening, and if it truly is a partnership, I'm kind of hard-pressed to see any reason why Skeens would say yes to this right? Like, unless he's planning on branching out from the West Coast and doing a Saison in New York City or Japan or Europe or Australia, Skeens has already has the recognition. He's already opening, what is it called, Antlers or something like that? Um, there's another restaurant he's opening that's more casual. It's like an oyster bar. It's like a raw bar. He doesn't need Laurent. That's basically the punchline. Um, but depending on, and, and for Laurent, depending on how much creative control he can get, I think that he is the winner in this kind of transaction, at least in the short term. He gets a fully decked out restaurant. Uh, he gets to come in and cook. I can only imagine what the menu is going to look like over the next few months. Uh, and he's done pop-ups at Saison at, at before. There's a bunch of really amazing photos from Laurent cooking with Josh Skeens at Saison. So this is probably years in the making, or it's just, again, Josh made the decision to leave Saison, and he wants Laurent to take it over. Just putting it on the record that that may or may not happen. Also, Laurent is 53 years old. So to all of you that are stressing about your first restaurant job or if you're making short-term decisions for your career right now, you have so much time. Just keep that in mind. Laurent Gras is 53 years old and he's taking a new job. So just keep that in mind. Last up, industry style. This is normally direct answer. You folks ask me a question and I answer it. Uh, as directly as I can. I'm always super grateful to receive those questions. But for this week, um, I've been doing a few coaching sessions with you folks, and I've been noting quite noticing quite a few themes coming up. So I want to cover one of those themes right now, and hopefully that will help more of you. It will um, help scale up that 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 helping that I can do. The coaching has been such a triple win. I get I get to help you folks with your specific problems, and then I also kind of get these really impactful, frequently asked questions, and then I can use those for future videos, um, and it just feeds the beast, which is amazing. So I'm going to keep doing the coaching sessions. They're working really well. I'm super happy with them. Um, but on to the question. A theme that I've seen come up over and over and over again is how do I get access? How do I, how do I get these seemingly titanic restaurants to notice me, Right. Say, for example, you don't have any experience with fine dining, but your desires and your ambitions are there, but these restaurants just aren't responding to your emails, right? And there's a bit of an art to this. I apologize that I've kind of avoided answering this question in this way before. There's like so many of my earliest YouTube videos were based on being as professional as possible. Um, I can say all day that I want you to go out there and hustle, but I don't, it's hard to convey that in like one of my first YouTube videos when I want it to be like utility, right? But the hard truth is if you're going to be cookie cutter and similar to everyone else, you're going to get treated like a commodity. If you, if your email looks like everybody else's email, it's going to turn into a commodity, right? Like there's almost 4,000 people following on YouTube right now and X number of thousand people have seen that stagiaire email template, right? So if they're sending the same email that you're sending, how are you going to stand out? It's just supply and demand, right? Like you need to find a way to stand out. And frankly, sending an incredibly well-crafted email and a beautiful cover letter is definitely part of the equation. Don't get me wrong. Like by writing a thoughtful email, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. So, but my question is, how can you leverage that, right? Like 
practice patience too. I remember being so frustrated after culinary school, per se, didn't have any space for me, right? I worked for them for free for six months, and then when I go back after graduating, the highest pedigreed culinary school in the U.S., they told me to go get a line cook job somewhere else for four months, and then they would call me if something came open, right? And I had all the connections. Hell, I could literally text the person that I wanted to hire me. It wasn't a problem of connection. I just couldn't get in. So what did I do? I started looking elsewhere. And to shorten this story a little bit, I stodged at this place called Atera back when Matt Leitner was the chef there. And Greg Backstrom, who's the chef of Olmsted, was a sous chef there. And they offered me a job, but Greg suggested that I check out this restaurant from this guy in Chicago called Curtis Duffy. And that's how Grace happened for me. So it's the idea of like you could spend all night sitting in the corner of the bar and staring at that attractive girl and then all of a sudden you get the courage to go up to her and your first words out of your mouth are like, hey, my name's Justin. I'm great boyfriend material. Will you go out with me? Right? Like which spoiler alert, it can work if done a little bit more elegantly than that or or flipping it, you can get more attention in another way. How can the chef that you're currently working for kind of wingman you in that situation? How can you go in and eat at the restaurant that you want to go work at and then become friends with one of the servers or the sommelier or the bartender and talk about how you're in the industry and you would love to have the opportunity to stage one day and check out the kitchen? Easy connection, super easy connection to make. Like, how can you go stage somewhere down the street and be super vague that you're just looking for a new job? in an ambitious kitchen, and somehow the new girl on the line just quit her job at the restaurant that you want, and then all of a sudden she's like, hey, I'm going to the sous chef's house on Sunday for a barbecue. You should come. I'd love to introduce you, right? Like, these are all interesting tactics where once you start to realize how small this industry actually is, especially if you're staying in a city for a long time, it's not that hard, um, you just got to kind of hustle it a little bit and it's, you, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. It's just like a relationship. You'll get what you want. Um, the worst thing you can do is expect it to just fall in your lap or expect to do the easy thing that everyone else is going to do and then expect that you're going to stand out just because you really, really want the job, right? So I'd encourage you to also have patience about it too. I was at that stage at Atera, uh, intending on working there. I was gonna, I was gonna say yes to the job that they offered me, and I was gonna work there for six months because I wanted per se eventually. And had I not gotten that advice to go to Chicago, I can only imagine where I would be now. But that's how it went. So that's 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 the the hopeful takeaway story <laughs> for you guys on being patient and kind of hustling to get that first job at the restaurant that feels out of your league. I'm always super, super happy to answer DMs from you folks, but if you do want to go deeper uh, and I have time available, you can definitely, definitely book a coaching session on justincona.com slash coaching. Uh, We'll talk through your ambitions on progressing your career and getting that raise at work and building a personal brand if that's something you're into or hosting pop-ups. It definitely allows me to go way deeper than just a back and forth message and provide some value and help you make your next move. So for making it this far in the episode, enter code end of the show. It's just one word and you'll get a discount on a session. I upped it recently to a sweet, sweet 30% discount. Just a little thank you for making it this far in the show. Uh, In our non-industry story of the week, I've got two pieces of gear uh, outside of the industry that I'm currently obsessed with. First is, I don't think I have them on the table here. Oh, I do. These distill sunglasses. I'll show them here first. Um, They look like Ray-Bans. These are probably a little dirty. I need to wash them a little bit. But um, they're insane. So for someone like me who's gone through at least a dozen sunglasses in the past five years, It's frankly embarrassing how bad I am with sunglasses, but these are really, really good. So they're polarized, which is great. They flex, if you can see that. They flex, which is great because I'm notoriously bad in sitting on them and uh, putting them in a bag and having them bump around with a bunch of different stuff. But the coolest part is that the, 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 what would you call these? The ear pieces, they magnet together. So I can put it on my shirt and it stays put, doesn't move. So I don't have to worry about anything basically. And like I can clip it onto a bag uh, or, or, or my shirt or my pants. And in the last three to four weeks of using these, because I did embarrassingly lose a pair of Warby Parkers and I'm super pissed about it. These are just 80 bucks. 
and I, like, I wasn't even mad that I lost the Warby Parkers because these are just so much better. I want to use, I almost want to get another pair as like a backup, but minimalism, I have my one pair. That's all I need. Uh, I'm also not being paid in any way to say this, but it's something that I wanted to cover because it's a product that I'm really excited about and it's not in the industry and I wanted to share it with you folks because it is summertime and you should be getting some sunglasses on to protect your eyes. So that's all. The other piece of gear that's over there on my shelf is a new camera lens. It's a 35 millimeter 1.2 manual focus lens. I've been having a ton of fun with that only because I'm, um, I'm such a fan of the 35 millimeter focal length for any of you guys that are super into photography. Um, you guys know I'm a big fan of Bonjwing Lee. He shoots almost all of his photos at 35 millimeter focal length at like a 1.4. It gives a super dreamy effect. Uh, it's not exactly like 100% sharp and in focus all the time, but it's just a really fun tool. And you guys know that I'm a big fan of photography as like a hobby. Um, I've done it professionally a couple times, but it's just one of those things I know is always going to be in my life. And with the tools getting so good, sometimes like the craft sometimes feels removed when you can like point your phone at your thing and turn it on portrait mode and the pho the photos look so good. There's something about like twisting a manual lens that's just really, really satisfying for me. So I'm really enjoying that. It's by a company called SLR Magic. Um, I will update it in my kit if I get a chance. So that will do it this week. For the show, episode 72, if you have stories that you want covered next week, shoot them to me on Twitter, hashtag the emulsion so I can find them. Uh, if you have questions for my upcoming guests, please check that out that schedule. Um, I've got a couple people that I have tentative e interviews with, but I need to actually schedule them, so stay tuned for that. That, that page is a little empty right now, but I have new uh, interview shows coming out for the next four to six weeks, I think. I have a lot of backlogged interviews ready to go. Um, you can also learn so much more about the podcast. Check out the show notes on justincona.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to the Emulsion Podcast. I appreciate your ears more than you know. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help sponsor the show, head on over to patreon.com slash justincona. Other ways you can help out right now include giving this show a review on iTunes so more people can find it. I also love seeing you folks liking and commenting on the video if you listen that way or even just share this episode with a friend. Now is normally why I would tell you that my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just gonna get out of the out of the way here. Excuse excuse me. <laughs>